Hello, welcome to Cardio Flash College, a place to learn cardiology with flash animations. Today we come with a collaboration of Dr. Carlos Igor Mor, cardiologist, part of the heart image unit of the Hospital Juan 23 of Tarragona. And together we will review everything you need to know about global longitudinal strain. Join us! As you know, the heart is a complex organ that bases its functioning in the systolic shortening of the myocardial fibers. This produces a simultaneous thickening of them, and finally, a change of volume in the left ventricle. Traditionally, ejection fraction has been the most used tool to estimate the change of ventricular volume, reaching an approximate value of 60% in healthy hearts. The problem is that the quantification of the volumetric changes occurred during the cardiac cycle is an insufficient way to study a much complicated process like cardiac contraction itself. As you know, the heart is conformed by a single muscle band that folds on itself, adopting a double spiral shape, achieving a peculiar spatial arrangement, and deeply efficient. So, the wall of the left ventricle is conformed by three layers of different myocardial fibers, the subendocardial fibers, whose core is longitudinal, the subepicardial fibers, whose core is spiroid, and the transversal fibers, whose course travels in between the other two layers. In this way, during systole, subendocardial and subepicardial fibers contract in different moments and in opposite sense. The subendocardial fibers are the first to activate, which generates a longitudinal shortening of them, a circumferential thickening, and an approach of the base of the left ventricle to the apex of the heart. By its own part, this process of shortening of the longitudinal fibers and simultaneous covilinear elongation of the subepicardial fibers generates a clockwise rotation movement of the base and counterclockwise of the apex, configuring a process known as twist or ventricular torsion. All this eases the ejection of the beat volume and prepares the myocardium for the ventricular relaxation. This phase is not a passive process. It is actually based on the antagonistic contraction of the subepicardial fibers, which allows the base of the left ventricle to rotate in a counterclockwise sense and to recover his initial position simultaneously, triggering a rectilinear elongation of the subendocardial fibers previously activated, which also recover his thickness and original length. This clinically translates into an increase of the ventricular volume and into an active suction of blood from the left atrium just after the opening of the mitral valve. Now, is there any tool that allows us to study a mechanism so complex as the one just described? Of course there is! Nowadays, we count with much diverse image techniques, for example the tissue doppler, the tagging, the feature tracking, and the speckle tracking. In this order of ideas, the objective of this video will be the study of the myocardial strain using the speckle tracking two-dimensional. But what is the speckle tracking two-dimensional? Very simple, it is an echocardiographic display mode that allows us to identify the acoustic irregularities produced by the interaction of the ultrasound waves within myocardial tissue. In other words, these acoustic markers, also known as speckle, are located by the software and followed in their displacement through the three dimensions of the space and along the cardiac cycle, giving information about the movement and the global and segmental deformation of the myocardial tissue. In this way, we can study the systolic function using the following parameters. The longitudinal strain or deformation that measures the shortening of the subendocardial longitudinal fibers. This is why, under normal conditions, its value is expressed as a percentage with negative sign. This is studied through apical views. The circumferential strain or deformation that measures the shortening that the perimeter of the ventricular cavity suffers through the parasternal short axis view of the transthoracic echocardiography. This is why, under normal conditions, its value is also expressed as a percentage with negative sign. The radial strain or deformation that measures the thickening of the muscle fibers that shape the myocardial wall through the parasternal short axis view of the transthoracic echocardiography. This is why, under normal conditions, unlike the previous ones, its value is expressed as percentage with positive sign. The twist or ventricular torsion that measures the difference of rotation between the base and the apex, 
It is expressed in degrees and it basically depends on subepicardial fibers. Its value, under normal conditions, represents the sum of the rotation of the apex and the base in absolute values, and that is why its value is positive. And finally, the strain rate or deformation speed that measures the difference of deformation speed that exists between the base of the ventricle and the apex. Of all these parameters, the longitudinal strain is the most used one because it represents the shortening of the subendocardial fibers and these are, precisely, the first fibers to be affected in most cardiopathies. In this way, the global longitudinal strain has achieved great clinical importance in recent years because it represents the average of the longitudinal strain of all myocardial segments obtained in the apical 4 chamber view, apical 2 chamber view, and apical 3 chamber view. Thereby, and according to the American Society of Echocardiography, the global longitudinal strain must reach an approximate value of minus 20% plus minus 2 standard deviations. Although we must assume this value can vary a little, depending on the machine's brand and on some technical aspects or specific clinical situations. In this way, we can say that, for example, the global longitudinal strain is lower in elderly women, in patients with arterial hypertension, obesity, diabetes mellitus, among others. Although at first glance it could look tricky, truth is that the global longitudinal strain has demonstrated having much less variability in its measurement than the ejection fraction or the diastolic function, parameters, in both cases, regularly used in the clinical practice. Thus, we can say that the global longitudinal strain is a precise and reproducible technique capable of identifying alterations of the heart function before changes in other parameters such as the ejection fraction even existed because, as you have seen, the ejection fraction shows the chamber function, while the strain evaluates the function of the fiber. This is why the global longitudinal strain has been turning, step by step, into a truly helpful parameter in certain clinical scenarios, which are heart failure. The global longitudinal strain has proven to be a strong prognostic factor regarding mortality and other adverse cardiovascular events up to five years, both in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and in patients with preserved ejection fraction. It is in this last case where the global longitudinal strain takes on special importance because, as you know, classic echocardiographic parameters can be a little precise in this scenario, being regular to find mistakes in certain occasions. In this order of ideas, we must know that, just like the ejection fraction, the alterations of diastolic function and the pro-BMP have a fluctuating character over time, usually appear late and, moreover, can be altered by independent phenomena such as transmitral flow or the myocardial relaxation. This is why the speckle tracking constitutes an interesting tool, because the reduction of the ventricular strain, or even the atrial strain, can be identified before ventricular filling pressures increase or the left atrium dilates. Besides, some authors suggest that the longitudinal strain can help identify patients that can benefit of a defibrillator or other cardiac implantable devices because it can not only help to estimate the risk of sudden death in patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy and with severe ventricular dysfunction, but it can also identify patients that can benefit from cardiac resynchronization when there is not the typical pattern of complete left bundle branch block. Finally, measurement of the longitudinal strain of the myocardial fibers that shape the free wall of the right ventricle can be helpful in two different clinical scenarios. The first one is the identification of those patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that can have an elevated risk of sudden death, and the second one is the identification of those patients that, being candidates to ventricular assistance, may need biventricular support. Myocardial hypertrophy as you know, the ejection fraction has serious limitations in the study of the systolic function of the left ventricle when the patient presents myocardial hypertrophy. Hence, this parameter is insufficient when identifying the type of cardiomyopathy and its prognosis, whereas 
the global longitudinal strain is not only capable of identifying the systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle in patients with myocardial hypertrophy and preserved ejection fraction, but it is also capable of identifying specific causes of myocardial hypertrophy, such as, for example, amyloidosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, fibre disease, hypertensive cardiopathy, or the athlete's heart. In the case of amyloidosis, we can say that the global longitudinal strain is reduced, especially due to a marked reduction of the mid-basal strain. This generates a classic pattern known as Japan flag, easily identifiable in the bullseye plot, which reflects the severe reduction of the mid-basal strain with hardly any affectation of the apex. In the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we can say that the global longitudinal strain is affected in patients with myocardial hypertrophy, so it is not capable to predict preclinical disease. In this way, segmental values tend to be mostly diminished regarding more hypertrophic zones and with extensive fibrosis, being able to become a prognostic factor of heart failure or sudden death. However, in particular cases of apical hypertrophy, global longitudinal strain is usually preserved and can be regionally normal, decreased, or paradoxically averted or positive, which means that there is a systolic elongation or apical dyskinesia. When myocardial hypertrophy is due to a Fabry disease, there is a decrease of the segmental strain at the level of the inferior, inferior lateral, and septal segments. Whereas, when the hypertrophy corresponds to arterial hypertrophy, the global longitudinal strain is reduced homogeneously. Finally, if myocardial hypertrophy is due to physiologic changes suffered in an athlete's heart, the global longitudinal strain is usually not reduced, but increased. Valvulopathies. As you know, in patients with asymptomatic valve disease, therapeutic intervention is based on the identification of morphological and functional changes that usually have a late appearance. This is why it is easy to comprehend that the strain is a tool of special importance in these cases, because it is capable of identifying the myocardial dysfunction in subclinical stages. In patients with severe and asymptomatic aortic stenosis, global longitudinal strain becomes an independent predictor of all-cause mortality when its value falls below minus 15%. By its own part, it has been proven that a global longitudinal strain value below minus 18% in patients with severe and asymptomatic aortic regurgitation associates with an increase of post-surgical events and that a value below minus 13% is a predictor factor associated with higher mortality at five years of follow-up. Finally, in cases such as asymptomatic primary mitral regurgitation with preserved and bordering values of ejection fraction, the global longitudinal strain usually decreases even before the telesystolic diameters of the left ventricle surpass the 45 millimeters. In this way, a value below minus 18% increases the risk of post-surgical left ventricular dysfunction. Cardio-oncology Nowadays, therapeutic decisions in oncologic patients treated with chemotherapy are based according to the changes that the ejection fraction suffers throughout the therapeutic cycle. However, as you can already suppose, the global longitudinal strain is capable of detecting systolic dysfunction early, not only in patients treated with chemotherapy, but also in patients treated with radiotherapy. Ischemic heart disease. As you know, typical changes of the ischemic cascade began in the endocardium, which is why the global longitudinal strain can be helpful in the study of patients with chest pain, although its value in real clinical practice is modest. However, in patients with revascularized myocardial infarction, a decrease of the global longitudinal strain can predict negative remodeling, transmural necrosis, and adverse cardiovascular events in the long term. As you see, the use of the speckle tracking for the study of the myocardial strain is an increasingly popular technique because it has demonstrated to be useful both in the field of biomedical research and in the clinical practice. Although we still have not been capable of exploiting all its potential, it is easy to imagine that, 
With time, the speckle tracking will become a tool of regular use during the performance of our healthcare activity. In this way, we say goodbye. It has been all for today in Cardio Flash College. We hope you liked the video. If so, subscribe to the channel and leave a like. We'll see you in the next class. And remember, don't come late. Bye.